Thank you. Next, we have Britt Haraway, coming all the way from the valley. Huh. Has a short story collection, of Early Men, which was published by Lamar University Literary Press. His stories have appeared in Natural Bridge, New Madrid, Great Weather for Media, Moon City Review, and elsewhere. His work was chosen for the Best Small Fictions 2016, guest edited by Stuart DeVeck. He is an assistant professor at the University of Texas, Rio Grande Valley, and the fiction editor for River Sedge uh, Magazine. He lives in McAllen, Texas. Um, this, uh, I, I would like to, to read something about the, the borderlands as well, where I've been teaching for a good while. Maybe a, maybe a different angle, uh, a, a grad student sort of uh, enjoys white privilege. And it's just kind of realizing um, that the wall and, and all of these policies are, are evil. You know, it's sort of just, just sort of waking up to that realization. And so uh, he and and a fellow student want to help a, um, a Native American family sue the, sue the government who, who uh, they're fighting the wall. And so um, this, this is kind of his, his coming aware of that uh, difficulty. I also kind of uh, wanted to read it too because, you know, the, the apprentice president has, has a lot of lies about life on the borderlands violent it is, and, and I, I don't find that to be re reality. So um, here, here goes a story from Early Men. And uh, I titled it that, uh, just uh, thinking that, you know, that humanity is something that we, we kind of have to, to earn and sustain for ourselves, and, and some of these, these young people that I write about are just sort of coming into that, so that's sort of the early part of that. So, um, this is our main character talking. Uh, I didn't write all that much, just a bit of history that helped me understand the wall. And uh, excuse me, this is the wall of 2009, George Bush, even Obama, uh, who built that. Um, understand the wall, the age of bones, finding the fishing gear and the boat evidence, a bunch of weapons. Earlier in that year, I helped write a grant with the professor studying the Reynosa side. The professor was not all that bad a guy once she got his attention, though it still annoyed me that he really only brought his full energy when talking to the women in our class. I wrote about how sometimes I'd get off work and go to Uncle Dewey's Park by the dam, and you could see the families on the Reynosa side playing. They were allowed to wade in the water on the Reynosa side, and one day I saw a brother and a sister throwing mud at each other, yelling, Espérame, as they tried to load up their own water mud. The mom was cooling off in the water tube, jeans rolled up, talking to one of the older children or an aunt. And the dad was upriver on their side of the park, tossing out a neon fishing net, waiting for it to spread out from his hand as if Spider-Man before the net hit the water. Nothing and everything changing. A border patrol boat zoomed around the bend in the river on the U.S. side, the agent piloting a boat with two engines with his knee. It had a rotating machine gun on the back and lots of lights. The boat threw up a wake, and the agent stared at me and them with this cold, bored attention. The guy stopped fishing until the waves died down. And in the article, I just listed the instincts at work at such a place. How there is an intelligence in anybody that pushes it to the best resources. And how it would always be there, thankfully, pushing people further and making sure we did not stay still, but strong and alive. So it, it sort of goes on. I just wanted, wanted to read that, that a little bit. Uh, most of the stories are kind of longer, so, uh, so I thought I would choose uh, a flash fiction uh, as, as my last thing here. This is called uh, Papa Two. It's, uh, it's kind of about uh, fatherhood. I'm, I'm a 
new, well, not new anymore. Uh, we have a, a six-year-old and a four-year-old. And um, so there's the, the kind of joys and challenges that go into that. And, and here I was thinking about some of, some of the joys and sort of being around children. Uh, renew some of your own, um, like you forgot how great watermelons were and stuff like that. So <laughs> this is kind of uh, about that. Fiction about that. Um, as Ashton was in the middle of drinking one night, he found himself in the kitchen carving a slice of watermelon for his child instead of pouring another one from the fifth. She'd asked so sweetly for the fruit that he felt guilty. Guilty for the few times he must have snapped when pulled from his life by her wishes. Through training, He'd strewn imaginary bells around his easy chair that his family knew about, and he liked them there. They kept his ex-wife in another room on the other side of town, her good cheer wrapped around some other man. They kept his mother off the phone or whittled down to just a few questions. If the money had arrived or how had the weekend gone with the girl? Hearing his daughter's soft voice say watermelon hadn't been part of the night's plan. He'd bought it at the farmer's market two weeks earlier, one near the park with the ducks that they liked to feed. He'd promised to open it that day, but instead forgot it in his car. The problem with watermelons is that they are unpredictable. It's just too much juice. It's ridiculous, really. They just keep feeding the melons water like crazy, and the next thing you know, your floor is sticky, and your wrists, and your kid has it all over everywhere. But she would remembered. So Ashton was carving a big slice like a long smile, and the knife felt good and easy going in. He was putting the slices on, pa uh, on a paper plate, and she was clapping and jabbering and then looking up at him like it was he who had done something. He wanted to tell her about his past, about the thousand mistakes and the lost chances, and also about the laziness. And she thought he'd made watermelons. Papa had some, Papa too. Alice was a weird kid. She was always wanting you to participate in something good she was doing. Her mother had been like that, too. There was no saying no. He'd forgotten about that great mix of watermelon, how the juice is there, but with the crunch, too, and how most often things just go soggy in all that wet, but the watermelon somehow keeps its significance. It is nothing, and it is a flood, and it has des uh, density and destiny a grainy texture that stays on your tongue, and the nice sound and resistance as you chew, the easy give that he felt when he sliced it up. It was something, the look Alice had given, and all the rush of sweetness of the melon, and it could have been that he had not had water that whole day, except for the slow ice melt that watered down the bourbon. But whatever it was, He'd not needed any more liquor that night. And when he put his head down on the pillow, it just sank all the way to the mattress. And that was it. <laughs>